uh, weaves. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that uh, we can put belts together. And uh, some, of the, some of the weaves that we will get into uh, will actually uh, have totally different uh, uh, ways to, to make the belt perform. Uh, this particular weave here uh, ha has a, a dark fiber woven into it and uh, this is going to give it some cross lateral uh, functionality. Uh, we, most, most belts have either uh, an interlocking weave or a, uh, a square woven weave uh, that, that we can impregnate and slit and work with. Uh, there are some fabrics that are totally interwoven, such as solid woven cotton, solid woven polyesters. Within the weave itself, you have the warp, which runs straight down the belt. You have the weft, that runs crossways. And then you have interlocking characteristics. You have, <clears throat> when you interlock the warp and the weft, this gives you the integrity. If you just had straight laid fabric, uh, number one, uh, if you had a tear, it would run all the way down. In heavy duty belt, very heavy duty belt, like steel cord belt, uh, sometimes they don't uh, monitor those and they don't have any sensors in them and a belt traveling at 800 feet a minute that has a break on it and it takes, uh, you know, 15 seconds for it to totally stop, you can ruin maybe a thousand feet of belt uh, in a heartbeat. Uh, and now you have two pieces of belt that doesn't work very well. So we, we use the WEF to help uh, stabilize our fabrics and it gives it a lot of different characteristics. Sometimes you'll have cross stability so it will lay flat. Uh, we will use different warps so that we will get very flexible or stiffer belts. Monofilaments, monofilaments, anybody fish? Uh, so you know what a monofilament fishing line is? Uh, it, it's a single strand, one fiber, and it's continuous. You can use it for your straight warp or you can use it in your weft to keep it to lay flat. Multifilaments, I guess most belts truly are multi-filament, uh, if you made a general uh, statement. Uh, you're going to take shorter fibers and you're going to spin them. Uh, and when you spin them, uh, you, will, you will get this multi-filament yarn, uh, like everything that we wear is basically like that. Uh, so the spun fabrics, uh, you, you'll, you'll, you can have those very tightly done or very softly done. And uh, so we, we, can, we can relate to fabrics that we wear. Some things are just ultra suede, uh, you know, they give us this nice soft touch. Other things are quite hard and, and, and quite rigid. So the nature of how we spin that uh, depends on the bond <coughs> of the cover. So solid woven, uh, solid woven <laughs> many years ago, was the predominant uh, form of uh, light duty conveyor belt. Uh, everything had to be woven per width because you couldn't slit it. Uh, you did impregnations with nitriles and put different covers with PVC and polyurethane and other things. But everything was, had to be woven to width and it had a finite length and uh, you couldn't weave something several thousand feet long because you just couldn't do it. And it was single ply, two ply, up through, I don't know, I can remember seven ply. Uh, and that was the mainstay of a lot of the early belting and then polyester went into that. And some of it was used bare for bakeries and some of it was used impregnated for handling fruits and vegetables. Uh, so it covered a lot of gamut of things before we started making these more uh, conventional products that you see today. Uh, your solid woven PVC belting, which is very common, uh, uh, is actually a solid woven fabric, usually of polyester spun fabric, and that is impregnated with P 
PVC and then coated or putting a contour on the surface. The combinations of uh, types of woven fabric together, uh, you, you can mix things as, as this example shows here. Uh, and then you can also blend fabrics uh, to form a particular uh, single layer. Uh, uh, needle punched. Uh, I, I know needle fabrics have been used as conveyor belt since about the 70s. Uh, uh, it, it's really kind of an interesting thing where you have this uh, scrim of fabric that is primarily your warp, doesn't have a whole lot of weft in it, uh, and literally you have these barbed needles that go through here and, and punch this, and they go through and they, there's kind of a felt on the top and a felt on the bottom, and it goes through and has these barbs and penetrates and comes back through, and it interlocks all of this felt and uh, fabric together. Uh, uh, one characteristic is it, it's very good for tear resistance. Uh, you can take and run it bare, top and bottom. You can put covers on it. You can do a lot of different things. So this is, this is a very different kind of way of doing uh, a particular uh, fabric. Quiet weave, you hear conveyors running. <laughs> they make noise. Uh, if you take a monofilament weave, which we've been talking about here, it's very hard, and when you run that on a slider bed, at anything from 100 feet a minute on up, it actually sings. I mean, you can hear it creating a singing noise. The faster the speed, the higher the pitch goes in that noise. So that's why Quiet Weave came about. Yeah, uh, non-fray uh, fabric of a special weave that's dipped and sealed. Uh, this, uh, this is very important. Uh, I can remember in some of the early weaves where some of the impregnation was not as good as it should have been and there was some interwoven type fabrics and, and you slit these uh, slabs into specific widths and the first thing you had was strings collecting on, on idlers and rollers and around the drive pulleys and take ups and so forth. And you can tell from this fabric that it will come apart readily but we can heat seal that oftentimes and it will eliminate it totally. Covers. Ron's going to cover this subject for us. Covers. Let's talk about two basic things as far as covers are concerned. There are two primary things you need to know about covers. They're either going to be a thermoset or a thermoplastic. A thermoplastic material is something that you can take, melt it, do something to it, whether it's a splice, add a V-guide, add a cleat, or whatever you want to do here, re-solidify it, and it comes back holding all of its original characteristics. So if it's flame retardant, if it's antimicrobial, if it's static conductive, all of these things, it does not lose any of its physical characteristics when you reset it. Now for the guys that have been in the business for a few months or whatever and doing installations, etc. You know what a thermoplastic will do because you can put it in a press, melt it down, get a nice splice out, it looks real good, easy to clean, and off you go. If you do that with a thermoset material, which is basically rubbers, silicones, and a couple of other things, that starts off in liquid form, is run through a manufacturing process, solidified, and once you put it into a set, it's done. If you reliquify it, it's nothing but goop from there on out. That's one of the technical terms for the day, goop, okay? <laughs> we'll give you a few other good ones as we go. So, the key thing here is, if you're gonna use something with a thermoset compound and you wanna add a cleat, add a guide, do a splice, you have to use an adhesive or a glue. With a thermoplastic, you do not. Okay? So with that on the mind, let's talk about some different compounds. PVC is the most common. It comes in, do you know what durometer is? Okay, the hardness of the material. It comes generally in durometer somewhere measured between 25 and 95 shore A. 
There are two shore scales that are used, a shore A and a shore D. D is the harder of the two. It basically starts where A stops and goes up. So most of this stuff is, is in this range. It can be smooth. We'll give you a couple samples of some smooth ones. And with these, you can do a lot of different things. Because it's thermoplastic in nature, you can add profiles to it easier, which we'll cover here in a few minutes. Okay, it's a good general cover compound. <coughs> you can get it in a non-food version for things like the airports, logistics centers, and so forth that we talked about a little while ago. You can get it in a food grade version, um, which is generally relatively oil resistant. There are certain places you don't want to use it. Polyurethane. Polyurethane can be made in a thermoplastic or a thermoset. Polyurethane is what they call a closed cell construction in most cases. Closed cell means it doesn't allow discoloration or anything to permeate down into the cover. And as examples of that, this is one that has a polyurethane cover on This happens to be transparent. A lot of them are white. We'll show you some more of those. Generally, durometers from 55 to 95. Polyurethane will give you better release than PVC does. So there's applications where a release is critical, you can use this. Applications where you don't want staining, where you want to minimize staining. Another thing that you would use this for is where you want to clean relatively easily. Sanitation is a huge thing today. If you're getting into the food industry at all, one of the things that everybody's beating everybody else up on is cleanability. We get into standards after a bit and we talk about FDA and USDA and everything else. This becomes a critical thing. Hytrel, another one that you can clean, is also a thermoplastic material. Good cut resistance and everything else. Down here at the bottom, we mentioned that it's pyrolysis compliant for the tobacco industry. If any of you call in the tobacco industry, and yes, there is still that industry in this country, believe it or not, you have to have a belt that does not support combustion if it breaks off, flakes off, gets into the cigarettes. I don't know if there's anybody in here that smokes, and I'm not asking, it doesn't matter. But if you get anything into a cigarette that causes it to flame up into somebody's face or gives off noxious fumes, they won't allow it in a tobacco plant, which sounds kind of strange, but it's true. Fabric. Tom passed around some samples earlier, these here, that we don't put a cover on. Since everybody's all alert and everything else, why do you think we wouldn't put a cover on something and just leave it go as bare fabric? If you look at one of these samples he sent around, this is one of those combination weaves. It's got polyester in the warp, cotton in the fill. Why would you put cotton in here? Another reason to use something without a cover on it. It absorbs. So if you're running it in an application where you're handling raw dough with moisture that you want to be able to draw some of the moisture content out as you run through the proofing process and everything, cotton allows you to do that. If you put a cover over the top of this, it won't happen. <coughs> Silicone, which is a rubber material, is a thermoset. It is used primarily for temperature resistance and very good release. Generally has a very tacky surface, which you can feel as those samples come around. And in spite of the tacky surface, does give you the good release that everybody's looking for. However, there are two downsides to silicone. It has very bad abrasion resistance. Therefore, if you're going to run this someplace for release, but they've got a scraper on it, chances are it's going to scrape the cover right off of there in very short order. So you've got to be very careful if you're using silicone someplace in the food industry that they're not running a hard scraper against it. Polyolefin is a thermoplastic material. Very good abrasion resistance. Very, very good release. Um, the nice thing about this is you can get something that's got very, very good release and still thermoplastic so that you can go in and do a splice now and get you a nice finger splice here that is nice and smooth and even throughout the belt and give you a real nice surface to work with. Also has a much broader temperature range. We didn't talk about temperature ranges for PVC or polyurethanes, but they generally cap off at about 194 degrees Fahrenheit. This will get you up to about 212. 
Polypropylene, more commonly found in plastic modular when we get to that. But there are belts coming out now with polypropylene covers on them, reason being because it has very good resistance to some of the chemicals that are involved here. One of the other things you got to be very aware of as you go in and do things for your customers and so forth, don't just look at the application and what they're running on it and that. One of the other critical things you need to find out is what are they cleaning it with? Because they will clean something with some very harsh chemicals that they're either A, not supposed to use, or B, when it says mix it 1,000 parts to one, that doesn't mean anything to whoever's doing the sanitation work, and they don't. You want to get pH factors. A lot of these things you can get MSDS sheets for to compare with the belt manufacturers that you're using to make sure that the belts will stand up to the chemicals they're using in the cleaning process. So there's something else you want to be aware of. Natural rubber is just what it says it is. It has no additives, no adders, no anything in it. Very good flex fatigue. It has excellent memory to it. I don't know if any of you are, are shooters and been to ranges or anything like that, but in some cases I know like the FBI range, um, which on the pistol range they have a short range and in the back of the targets they actually hang sheets of natural rubber because it will stop the bullet from penetrating any further. And if it does penetrate, what happens is it has a tendency to seal itself back up. So natural rubber in a belting side now has excellent wear characteristic, very good abrasion resistance, will help seal and heal itself as it goes, and it's used where you want some very good grab or grip on something. Temperature ranges, not too bad, but, but, big but, don't use it any place where there's going to be oil. It will swell, It'll flake apart, break apart, do all kinds of nasty things. So if you've got any kind of oil, petroleum, vegetable, whatever, don't use it. Nitrile, we get into different rubbers now. We basically take natural rubber and we start adding things to it. And nitrile is one of the more common ones you'll see. All of these, by the way, are thermosets. So how do we put them together? Glue, adhesive. We'll start passing some samples around of different rubber covers. All of these, as we go through the rubber materials, are thermoset. They will give you two things generally better than a PVCs and so forth. They give you better abrasion resistance. They give you better heat resi resistance as far as the range that they will take. Neoprene, which is another rubber material, very good mechanical properties. This has better chemical resistance than does the previous one that we were talking about. And it's another one you'll find in the food industry. One of the more interesting ones is butyl, because here now you've got something from a temperature range that will go all the way down to minus 60, but also get you up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're handling any kind of hot product, and when we talk about covers, we're generally talking about what is coming into contact with the cover. What is the product temperature they're working with? Environmental temperature is critical too. Because if you're working in an oven somewhere where there's a lot of hot, dry air floating through here, you've got to take that into consideration when you pick your belt styles. So butyl is one of the best ones as far as temperature range resistance is concerned. Silicone is better. It'll generally go up to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit depending upon the blend that is used. And all of these have some variations. SBR, good abrasion resistance. You don't see um, a lot of this, uh, not as much as you used to anyway. So these are the different rubber compounds that we're working with. Then we have felt. What felt is, it's a needle punched or a non-woven material. It doesn't go through the weaving process like the base fabric does. And what they do is it's, if you look at the uh, car liners in over the roof of the car. That's a needle punched material. If you've ever seen them redoing road beds, 
and they put this green material down before they pour the concrete to give it a base, that's a felt material. It's a non-woven material. It's used in a lot of different things. So felt is another type of cover that we do. Then there are blends. Somebody says there's not enough different options here. We don't make enough different styles. So let's do a blended. And we took a PVC and a thermoplastic rubber and put those together. And there is a thermoplastic rubber. And now you get a blended and what, what does that do for you? Well, it gives you the better options of both materials. So now we get better abrasion resistance than a PVC normally offers. You get better temperature range resistance than a PVC normally offers. If you blend it with polyurethane, you pick up some of the better characteristics of that. So you can get blended materials that run. Now you're not going to blend a thermoplastic and a thermoset. And you're not going to blend PVCs and polyurethanes because they are dissimilar materials that will not mate up. So for the guy that goes out in the field to splice a PVC belt and takes a piece of PU film with him, what do you think is going to happen? Not going to work. Last but not least, we have PTFE, which most of you would recognize as Teflon. Okay. Teflon, very good for temperature ranges. Generally, you can get up above 500 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe up to close to 600 and some degrees. Outstanding release, no abrasion resistance whatsoever. You will find this on belts that are used for high temp applications. Um, this happens to have a Teflon cover on it, this one here. It has rubber in underneath. Again, this is another one you got to be very, very careful of. Don't use scrapers on this because it will have a tendency to cause it to flake off, break off, and deteriorate rapidly. Also used for tape, if you've got um, presses or anything where you're, where you're running release pads in here, that will be Teflon. If you're running uh, any type of bonders with a strip off head on it, for V's and rounds and that type of stuff. That'll have Teflon on those. That's Teflon tape that's on that. So it's used in a lot of different things. So the, the basic thing to do here from a starter standpoint is find the simplistic things that you're going to see day in, day out. Monofilament weaves for where you want a belt to lay flat. Multifilament weaves for where you want something that's going to trough or maybe going to be something relatively wide or stronger because generally multi-filaments are stronger. Solid woven, uh, which Tom alluded to earlier, places where you're going to be using lace to put it together because it has better lace retention characteristics. And then when you get to covers, PVCs, polyurethanes, and generally one of the rubber compounds are going to be the critical ones you run into every day. All these exotic things, to use your term, are out there. And all these exotic weaves and non frays, et cetera, et cetera. But take the basic stuff first, and let the rest come to you as you get comfortable with it. Tom. On temperatures, uh, when you look at a temperature rating, say 500 degrees for the Teflon, remember that the fabric that that Teflon is sitting on will not take 500 degrees. So you're talking about simply. The, the surface temperature that you would be exposed to rather than the environment. Ron mentioned the environment, but uh, Teflon is very, very thin. Uh, silicone can be much thicker. Uh, you have to really pay attention to the total environment because none of these fabrics will take anywhere near those high temperatures. So a lot of times when you do have high temperature applications, it's simply momentary contact or it's intermittent and there's a chance for it to cool off or chance for the heat to dissipate. So just be careful. Don't let somebody say, yeah, I've got an oven running at 500 degrees and you're going to put a Teflon belt in there. Be careful of that. Some of these other samples we're going to pass around now so you can see some different options on things. This one here this actually, if you look at the back of this compared to the samples you've seen coming around so far, you'll notice there's a little difference on the back side. This is a non-fray. And generally what they do with non-frays, as Tom pointed out earlier, is they dip it or they run it through some type of bath 
so the fabric absorbs some of the material. It's always going to be polyurethane. Okay, and then a cover is put on it. So that's one. Can you put covers on both sides of the belt? Yes. yes. Sure. We just passed one down that's got a smooth cover both sides. Here's one that's got a smooth cover on top and a, a texture or profile cover on the bottom. So there's a couple of different things you can do there. Why would you put a cover on the bottom? <coughs> Friction, give you more grab. Why else? Prevent it from water bonding. Prevent it from what? Describe water bonding so they know what that is. They, anytime you have an application where there could be a change in temperature of the, the load or if that conveyor would happen to be shut down and the temperature drops, you're going to get an effect of moisture collecting below the belt. I had an early experience of this in the, in the building industry in the bunk feeder market. Uh, where we had a rubber cover on the back side of a basically a slider bed application. The system was about 150 feet long. The change in temperature overnight in an outside application created a water effect on between the two layers. The motor wouldn't start. It was so it was just like it was cemented in place. Now you break that up by having some kind of a fabric the friction surface or w woven fabric on the backside or a profile of the backside, you will not have the same effect of the water bonding. Now Roy's talking about a conveyor that has a slider bed. It's a yeah. solid piece of stainless steel and that built a lay right down on it. It's like pulling the chamois across the top of your car when it's wet. You know how same that feels. Thing. Yeah. Same thing. Okay. So another reason to do it is also to protect the fabric. Because if you're in a high contamination atmosphere, with a lot of dust, a lot of dirt, or anything else on the bottom side of that conveyor, you want to protect that fabric so it doesn't get torn up, ripped up, contaminated in some fashion or another. So we're going to do something here to protect the fabric on the bottom side. So that's why we put a cover on it. Any questions on compounds, materials? Basic ones are PVC. Polyurethane, rubber, okay? Just remember those, remember those two weaves or three weaves we talked about, we're good to go. So why, now we're gonna talk about profiles. Now we're gonna take a smooth cover and we're gonna do something to the top of it to change the texture of it. And a profile is just that. We're changing it, putting a texture of some kind or another on the top side. The most common when you do thermosets, let's start with this before we get into this. When you do thermoset material, this happens to be a rubber rough top version. Thermoset, when they run this through the process, the profile is put into it in the manufacturing process, put into place. It is not, not going to change. If it does change, then you've ruined the belt. And by that, I mean if you're going to put something on here, you need to put a V-guide on the top side, or if you needed to put a cleat or something else on the surface of this belt, as we said before with thermosets, it's destroyed if you don't do it with a glue or adhesive, as you pointed out earlier. So we have thermosets that are made, and they're going to take that shape forever. And these are, there's a variety of different ones. There are probably 200 different profile configurations out here that are available. If we don't do a raised profile, we do an inverted, which means it's set down into the belt. Now what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of contact points that we get with whatever we're carrying for release. So these are some examples of an inverted. You will hear them referred to with some of the terms that are up here, inverted pyramid, inverted diamond, lattice, basket weave, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody calls them a little different. Matte finish. What is a matte finish? Dull. Doesn't shine. Okay. If you if you look at a smooth covered belt, most of them have some type of sheen or shine to them. Correct. Now, if you've got people that are working over those all day long, what happens? Glare, 
hurt your eyes, you get tired faster, pretty soon they're not paying attention to what's running across in front of them, especially if it's on an inspection line. Matt is actually a profile. If you look at it under a microscope or look at it very closely, it has what appears to be a lot of little pits in the surface of it. And that's what gets it to matte finish. That's the ones you'll see on the checkout counters. That's the ones you'll see in certain treadmills. And then there's some other applications where they will use a matte finish. Just enough to break it up. Now we talked a little bit about thickness and width limitations. As we mentioned before, all profiles have some type of width limitation. In rubber, generally it's at 72 inches. If you want anything wider than 72 inches in a profile, you're going to have to have a longitudinal splice in it. Okay. So, with those width limitations in mind, check with the manufacturers, find out what the maximum width is on some of these profiles. Some of them are made up to three meters wide. Others are only made at two. Some are only made at 1,500 millimeters, which is 59 inches. It depends on the manufacturer. It depends on what kind of drum they have. A good stainless steel, two meter wide profile drum today that's not too complicated will cost a manufacturer somewhere around $125,000. They're not going to go out and just spend $125,000 for the fun of it. So those are things to be aware of but make sure you check with the specific manufacturers to see what is available.